we're not going back to the same economy. We're going, we're recovering, but to a different economy. And it'll be one that is more leveraged to technology. And I worry that that is going to make it even more difficult than it was for, for many workers. In Silicon Valley and my friends who work in technology know that what we did to the manufacturing workers, we are now going to do to the retail workers, the call center workers, the fast food workers, the truck drivers, and then even bookkeepers, accountants, uh, insurance, agents, lawyers, and on and on through the economy. So what happened to the manufacturing workers is a very clear sign of what's going to happen to these other workers moving forward. And I talk Welcome to the Crypto Teacher. And guys, you know, I come back with that second video and we're going to listen to Jerome Powell. What we call labor market scarring, but what it really amounts to is people losing the life they've made in the workforce. And that's, that's really the thing that we're most focused on is is getting this getting back to a strong labor market quickly enough that people's lives can be uh, can get back to where they want to be because we we were in a good place in February of, of 2020 and uh, we think we can get back there I would say much sooner than we had feared. So those are some topics, um, very good ones. Uh, let me start with the treasuries. So of course, everything we do has to tie into our mandates, which are maximum employment, price stability, financial stability. And I would say restoring a critical market such as the treasury market to functioning. The treasury market is so central to all markets uh, that, that clearly ties into uh, our role. And we, uh, I wouldn't, I'd say we were what we did is we bought. We, we weren't making a market. We were buying a lot of, uh, of treasuries and MBS, and I mean a lot. So, and, and I would add though that the performance of the treasury market and the mortgage market in the acute phase of the crisis does suggest that we need to think about market structure and greater resiliency. I know you had different. So I think there was a lot, there's a lot of gratitude. And this comes with being the, res, the res, global reserve currency and a good economic citizen of the world. But it really helps people in the United States a lot as well. It's not something we give to the world. Treasury, it, it would be, it was an important factor. Um, on the fiscal helicopter drop, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take a, a bit of a dodge on that, if I may. You know, that's straight fiscal policy. Um, you can argue the need for that for countries that are sort of in a, in a permanent liquidity trap and. But we're, that's not that's not the United States. You know, we 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 have policy space. We'll have policy space for interest rates again fairly soon. I mean, in the in the sweep of history, mm -hmm. uh, it'll take a few years. But so I'll, I'll I'll take a pass on that one if I could. Jerome stated he wanted to get the people back employed. Guys, don't forget it was the Fed that put the people out of work. Don't forget what the C word was about to get rid of the old economy and bring in the new, the fourth industrial revolution. Now, guys, you know I talk about treasuries. And like he stated, they were buying the treasuries. That's right. Guys, a hundred billion a month treasuries and mortgage-backed securities. Jerome took a pass on about the people getting 2,000 stimulus checks, guys. He took a pass said we are not in a liquidity crisis when we have over $7 trillion on the balance sheet and we have no interest rate. The only savior is what, guys? That's right, cryptos. Industries and the central banks, not only for the U.S., but also for other countries. Okay, so uh, to start with um, public debt and monetary policy. So I just would say, first of all, the, the U.S., is not on a sustainable path at the federal government level in the simple sense that the debt is growing substantially faster than the economy. And that means by definition, it's unsustainable. That's not to say that the level of debt is unsustainable and it's not unsustainable. It's far from unsustainable. And so I, I, I think we're a long, long way from fiscal dominance uh, in the United States if we ever get to that place. And it certainly is not a factor that we consider in any way at this time. So high public debt in no way impacts monetary policy. Now, we, we are squarely focused on serving the public through our new framework to achieve maximum employment and stable prices. Um, <clears throat> I My strong view is that central bank independence is an institutional arrangement uh, that has served the public well. 
And I think, you know, every advanced economy democracy around the world has uh, central bank independence, uh, institutional arrangements differ, but I, I do believe it has served the public. Well, I, I frankly think that is well understood uh, among uh, elected representatives. And um, I, I don't, I, I think on both sides of the aisle, people do understand that he, that that having an independent uh, uh, central bank really does help, particularly in times of crisis, but also just through the business cycle, where you can you can really be focused on serving all of the American people and ignore political considerations. Intermediation has broken down, or 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 isn't working uh, to the point where the rates that are being charged are just not not in the in the range of normal. So that's that's when 133 comes into effect. We use those the 133 quite aggressively and to good effect during the financial crisis. Dodd Frank took the position uh, and made it the law that if you're going to do that kind of emergency intervention in in the markets uh, then you really should have participation and approval from elected governments in the form of the executive branch and that means the treasury. So Every facility that we set up under under Section 13.3 requires the approval of the Treasury Secretary. I would say I think that's good policy. I think that's that's appropriate, and um, I would I would uh, it's also the law. So you know we're, that's what we did, and um, you, you'll make your own judgment. People will make their own judgments, and we'll study it. But my own sense is that we uh, that our collaboration with the Treasury was very successful throughout this, and it really did work. And there was a lot of benefit too, because you know the the, the treasury has um, they have sole responsibility for for fiscal policy. It's the treasury who you know we're we're not in the negotiations, and we don't want to be in the negotiations over fiscal policy. Um, we we speak to fiscal policy at a high level, um, uh, you know, and try not to get into the details. And we're not you know we don't want to be in the details, but treasury is in those. And so for treasury also to be part of thirteen three, I think I think it helps treasury have a have a strong perspective, and I, I think the whole system uh, works. And and the other thing I'll say is, as I mentioned, there are people at the Fed and at Treasury who have this institutional knowledge. Um, the The relationship is a good one. We, it, it, I think, finance ministries and, and central banks around the world do know one another well. We stay in our lanes. We have different authorities, different responsibilities. We respect that. And we stay in our lanes and, and they stay in their lanes. So I, I think it, I think it does work. I think our, our current institutional arrangements that we have are quite workable. Uh, and, uh, and asset purchases is not time-based. It's, it's outcome-based. You know, it, it requires the achievement of various uh, objectives and, and those will, those objectives will come when they come rather than when, when, you know, one might mark a calendar because you really can't do that in, in advance. Um, we, we, but we will, of course, be very, very uh, uh, transparent as this comes, uh, as it, as we get as we get close. So I, I would just say this on the um, uh, current situation: when it does become appropriate for the committee to discuss, you know, specific dates, uh, and that will be when we have clear evidence that we're making progress toward our goals and that uh, we're on track to make substantial further progress toward our goals. When that happens, um, uh, and we can see that clearly, we'll let the world know. We will communicate very clear, clearly to the public, and we'll do so, by the way, well in advance of active consideration of being, beginning a gradual table of, table of asset purchases. So that's how we're thinking about that. Um, uh, on, on, I'll start. I'll say something about CBDC. So we, we don't have. Um, an explicit plan to do what you articulated, but the way since we are the world's reserve currency, we actually think we we need to get this right, and um, and we don't we don't feel an urge to, or need to be uh, to be first. We have effectively it means we already have a first mover advantage because we're the we're the reserve currency. So, and I I, I think there are. Um, both benefits and potential costs and unresolved questions around CBDC. And so we're committed to, technology has made this possible and um, 
you know, it's effectively uh, private sector actors can create the equivalent of digital money. We know that in the past, when private sector money, the public sometimes just thinks of it as money. And then at some point they, they find out that it's not money. And that's, that's a really bad thing we, we need to avoid. So we're going to look at it very, very carefully. And, you know, we're, we've, and we're investing heavily in understanding the technology and, and analyzing the policy uh, uh, policy questions, the many policy questions that come. We will also do, as we, as we go through this process, we'll do a great deal of outreach to every constituency that would be interested, including um, you know, elected representatives, including financial sector participants, including as we did with the, with the, the monetary policy review, the people we serve. Uh, you know, to try to understand what are the use cases, do we need this, how would it help, what are the benefits, uh, and I think all of that we will, will inform our uh, our thinking as we go through it. So I think we're, we're, we're determined to do this right rather than quickly, and it will take some time, I think. Uh, it'll take, you know, me measured in years rather than months, um, but I, I would say since it's possible and private sector is already kind of doing it, I think this is something we need to take very, very seriously. This will be a different economy when we come out of the pandemic. Now, Jerome stated that debt is unsustainable. And guys, we already know that. We don't need him to tell us this. We don't need the Princeton grad to tell us, guys. We just had Biden say he wants to give $15 an hour. What do you think the corporations are ready to do? That's right, unleash the robots. Unleash the fourth industrial revolution. So you want $15? Okay, we're going to get rid of five and one person is going to run the robots. We already know the plan, guys, the fourth industrial revolution. Now he says the central bank has served the people well. What do you think, people? That's right. They're putting you homeless. Now you can go back to all the leaders in Congress that stood up against the powers that be. They stated if you allow a bank to control the supply of your money, the next generation will be homeless. And that's what we see now, guys. Isn't that a mystery? Now, he also says the central bank helped in the crisis. Guys, they created the crisis. That's right. Problem, reaction, solution. And you haven't seen anything yet. Over the next four years, they're going to destroy this economy to what? To bring in the new, which will consist of universal basic income. Now, he also talked about Dodd-Frank, said that you have to go through the Treasury. So what did they do? They bought in their puppet, Steve Mnuchin. And now we have, lo and behold, who? Janet Yellen, who used to be a part of the Fed, who knows the Fed backwards and forward and knows what they want to do. Guys, do you think that's by chance? No, you definitely shouldn't. And who is in the SEC? Gary Gensler, that's right. Who's always around who? The MIT and the actual Fed. Guys, it's all connected. They're ready to bring the house down. Remember, as China, the dragon is going to rise and Babylon is going to fall. But it's going to fall with inside, guys. Now, Jerome stated that they're going to let us full notice when they're going to taper back on purchases. But the fact is, guys, we see what the actual plan is. All this money printing is not by chance. Guys, these people are geniuses, revenge of the nerds. They're printing all this money to actually fund the fourth industrial revolution, putting all this money in these shell companies, and they're going to collapse them and keep it moving. This is all mafia, guys, if you understand it. It's called the good old bust out. And then lastly, guys, he talks about the digital currency. And guys, we know this is the whole goal. The whole goal is to bring the digital currencies on. Because with digital currencies, it allows this Ponzi scheme the Fed is running or that's going to be on blockchain, Federal Reserve 2.0. It allows it to go on forever. And guys, remember with the New World Order, what? Problem, reaction, solution? Because don't forget, Everything the New Road Order do is already planned out. Have a wonderful day.